Well, good evening, everyone. This evening's talk is called Do Not Worry or Do Not Be Anxious. It's taken from Matthew 6, starting at verse 24. Worry and anxiousness are essentially the same thing. Some of you may argue with me, but essentially the same thing. Now, I know we usually encourage you to bring your Bibles and uh, follow along with the reading. But can I encourage you not to do so this evening? The whole scripture will come up on the screen later when we need it. And I would prefer for us to be able to sit in quietness uh, without any distractions. In a moment, I'm going to ask us all to close our eyes. I will start with a prayer. Uh, and then set the scene for the giving of this message from Jesus on the hillside overlooking the Sea of Galilee. I will then read the passage, and if you're happy to do so, I suggest you keep your eyes closed until it feels right to open them. Is that all right with everyone? That's not an invitation to fall asleep. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, creator and sustainer of all things, you love and care for us more than we know. Help us, Lord, to relinquish into your hands the troubles and activities of today and rest in the presence of Jesus. Lord, as we climb with you now up onto the hillside above the Sea of Galilee, bring alive your words. It has been a warm and sunny day. The last of the afternoon sun is still warm and pleasant on our faces, with only the faintest of breeze rising up from the sea. Wildflowers bloom in abundance all around Their delicate fragrance is carried on the breeze. The lark and the pipit call out their songs. It's a wonderful place Jesus has led us to. The sea below shimmers in the late sun. The dry grass and the hot and the rocks are warm and inviting as we gather around him. And Jesus is saying, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much, not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you you of little faith. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. 
each day has enough trouble of its own. It's easier said than done, isn't it? I wonder where you are with worry. We all worry about something. Some of us will have a handle on it and cope reasonably well. Others of us will be serial worriers. Perhaps you're someone who worries about everything. It may be money and financial concerns, or it may be health and illness or injury, or it may be work and the load that is being imposed upon you, or maybe a colleague who's being particularly difficult. It may be your children. Am I doing okay as a parent? It's possible you worry about all these things, and the worry causes you to be anxious and seems to crowd out everything else. You get to a place where you can't see the wood for the trees. It all becomes too much. And you don't know how to continue. A dark depression can close in around you. We're all on this spectrum of worry somewhere. When I told my wife, Judith, that I'd been asked to talk on this passage, she said, why you? You don't worry about anything. Well, that's not entirely true, as she well knows. But I do agree, I worry less than most and often give the impression of that nothing worries me. Don't be fooled. I do worry much more than most people realize. Worry is not the same as care and concern. Care and concern are both healthy. If we go through life without a care in the world, there's something wrong with our hearts. God made us in the image of God, in his image, and God is love. And love means that you can care deeply for those around you. When Jesus visited Mary and Martha after Nazareth died, we are told he was deeply moved in his spirit and wept. And again in the town of Nairn, the widow there is about to bury her only son. And Jesus is filled with compassion and prays life into her son. So it's natural, good, and healthy to care and have concern for people and circumstances. But worry is different. Worry is a tag-along, an extra burden we pick up that's totally useless, unnecessary, unhelpful, and not required. It's been said that worry is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it gets you nowhere. Jesus says in verse 27, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? Jesus points out the futility of worry. It achieves nothing, it gets us nowhere. The fact is it spoils our lives and may even shorten our lives. Worry, I believe, is born out of fear. Fear that you won't be able to pay the bills. Fear that the cancer will return. Fear that the cancer will take your life or the life of a loved one. Fear that your boss is going to be unhappy with you. Fear that you haven't done enough, that you're not good enough. Fear that you won't finish that work project in time. Fear that you won't do the right thing for your children. Fear that what you do for them will mess them up. 
fear of what the future holds, fear of the unknown, fear that you may never find a life partner. There are many other fears that lead to worry. Corrie ten Boon, who spent time in a concentration camp during World War II and had very good reason to be afraid and knew plenty about sorrow and loss, said several things about worry. Here are two. Worry is a cycle of inefficient thoughts whirling around a center of fear. And worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. Jesus tells us quite clearly not to worry. The Greek word here is marimna, and it means literally drawn in opposite directions, divided into parts, to go to pieces because pulled apart, divided, distracted. This fits exactly with what Jesus says in verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The two masters he's talking about are the prince of this world, the prince of the air, Satan, and the king of eternity, God. In verse 33, Jesus continues, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. And I think we can see from this just how negative and unhelpful worry is. If our attention is divided and distracted, we can't be focused on Jesus. We can't be reliant on him and his perfect provision. As Christians, I believe God is calling us to have complete faith in his faithful provision. Our God is the creator and sustainer of the universe. That's how big he is. But he also loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us. That's how much he loves and cares for us. Why wouldn't we trust him with our lives? So how do we practically move away from worry and the divided attention that comes with it? How do we focus on Jesus and develop a stronger faith in his faithful provision? Someone quite helpfully has said, worry is a conversation you have with yourself about things you cannot change. Prayer is a conversation you have with God about things he can change. And Corrie ten Boone is helpful again here. She says, the wonderful thing about praying is that you leave a world of not being able to do something and enter God's realm where everything is possible. Nothing is too great for his almighty power. Nothing is too small for his love. Quite early on in my walk with Jesus, the Lord showed me how important it was to give things over to him and trust him with them. I remember this occasion so clearly. I had just loaded both our small kids. They were probably about... Uh, six and two, into our Volvo. I kissed, I kissed Judith goodbye and watched her pull away. Judith was taking them off to her mum's, but this was the first time she had taken my car. For some reason, her little manual Nova was out of action, and now she was driving my automatic Volvo for the first time. As I went back into the house, I was just overwhelmed with worry. I paced the ground floor, wringing my hands, feeling sick and helpless. What have I done? 
I was fearing for their lives. Not that she was a bad driver, if you understand. But I was fearing for their lives. I was totally paralyzed. I tried to put, pull myself together and I remember taking the stairs to the upstairs thing. I've got to go to work. I took the stairs two at a time. And as I went up the stairs, I just was prompted by God, pray. And so as I turned into that little bit of a corridor at the top of there, it opened into our bedroom, I prayed. And I barely started praying and um, peace just came over me. And I knew everything was going to be all right. I don't think I gave him a second's thought for the rest of the day. Uh, it wasn't until the evening when I came back for supper. I realized, oh, they'll be back. They're all okay. Well, this morning I gave that. I, I, I told Judith I was going to use that passage and read what I've written. And... Um, She told me that she remembers that day just as well as I do because she got to the point of the driveway to Berry's Court School and she was so overcome with worry and anxiety that she pulled into the drive and she prayed. And from that point on, she felt as if Jesus was in the passenger seat and everything was fine. Now, she told me that this morning. First time I've realized. But we must have been praying at the same time. It takes five minutes to get to Berry's Court. That's about the time I paced around the kitchen and downstairs of the house. How good is God? How faithful is he? sounds so simple, doesn't it? And yet we find it hard to do. Psalm 55 says, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. In Psalm 56, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. When fear knocks on the door of our lives, let faith answer. Now, I know that some of us have faith and trust God with our problems, but we still worry. So is it that we just don't have enough faith? I don't think so. I think we just don't know our own limitations. We hand the burden over because we know God can be trusted and he alone has the power to change the situation. But we pick it up again because there must be something more we can do. As part of their 12-step recovery program, Alcoholics Anonymous use a prayer which says, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. We will all be tempted to worry. Some of us will feel we're addicted to worry, and worry is born out of fear. But Jesus tells us to replace fear with faith and to cast our burden onto him. Don't let's pick it up again. Let go and let God. I can't think there's anyone in this room who can say they really don't worry. So can we all stand together?
I think it's important that we just acknowledge that God is a great big God. He's a super provider. I mean, everything we need, he can provide. So let's just pray together. Heavenly Father, you know everything we need before we know it ourselves. You have the ability to change every situation that we encounter. You tell us, Lord, not to worry. Yet we can't help ourselves. Lord, help us, enable us to hand our burdens over to you and never to take them back up. you're one of those serial warriors the band's just going to start to play music but if you're one of those serial warriors will you come out and let's pray